Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to episode 37 of GBR. And I just wanted to let you know that we won't be doing any reviews or demos today. Sorry. Not that that should come as any surprise, but one thing I am surprised at is how well last week's episode played. As usual, I I made a point of having no expectations, but once again, operating in the expectancy of the best possible result, whatever that may turn out to be. So we introduced our Greatest Foundational Hits series with Volume 1, and this featured five players that we've talked to previously, including Nathan East, Peter White, Carl Verheyen, Chris Standring, and Bruce Foreman. Now, my main reason for doing that show was really to help call attention to the players that do come on GBR because, frankly, we're looking to bring more of them on to talk about the business of guitar that they're involved in. That's what we do. And I've heard from a number of folks that said they hadn't listened to those episodes before, but they're going to go back and listen to them now. Plus, we've been reaching out to a number of well-known players about coming on the show, and this episode has actually turned out to be a great showcase to feature what we're doing and the high caliber of interviews that we've had with these other guys. So as we've been working to fill up the pipeline of upcoming interviews as we go into this busy holiday season, so important, I thought to myself, well, maybe we should do another one of these this week. So today... Our Greatest Foundational Hits, Volume 2, features five CEOs, each with their own story to tell about how they got started on the path that got them where they are today and what kind of foundation they built. And you're going to be hearing from Tom Bedell, CEO of Breedlove and Bedell Guitars, Mike Robinson, CEO of Eastwood Guitars, Patricia Butler, co-founder and CEO of ArtistWorks, David Kalt founder and CEO of Reverb.com, and Crystal Morris, co-founder and CEO of Gator Cases. So with that, let's get right into something completely different. Well, Tom, thanks so much for coming on the show with us today. It's really great to have you. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate the invitation. Excellent. Excellent. Well, listen, let's get started. You know, so I, I, I guess our listeners are kind of getting used to the format here, but uh, uh, we always like to start off with some foundational background so that we understand, listeners understand a bit more about what your business and, and career has been built on. So I'm wondering if you could give us a little history lesson. Well, Jeff, I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1950 and um, lived through the, the Leave it to Beaver years for a while, and then uh, <laughs> certainly the awakening years of the 1960s with oh, yeah. uh, the folk rock music. I'm sure you remember uh, us going to the coffee houses and I'm afraid playing so. the latest Bob Dylan <laughs> songs and writing our poetry and having our friends help us. Well, um, I started giving guitar lessons at the local music store in Spirit Lake, Iowa, uh, when I was 13. And the class got all filled up, and we were selling a lot of guitars because that was the, the time when people really wanted to express themselves, their thoughts, their feelings about society and their role in society. And so instead of teaching out of Mel Bay's book, uh, She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain, <laughs> I taught the stuff that uh, we all really cared about. Things didn't work out at the store, um, so I went home and asked my folks if I could set up a, a lesson studio. Of course, they were more than happy to help me with that. My dad had a contact in Japan. He was in the fishing business and um, had an agent that helped him purchase parts. So I asked dad if I could ask Kashiki to see if he could get me some guitars that I could sell to my students. So he went down to Nagoya where the, the guitar factories were and sent me catalogs. And I went through the catalogs and picked some guitars and, um, and uh, send him a telex. You know, there was a big cable under the ocean that oh, uh, yeah. That's we right. could send messages. To Japan. That's right. You know, you talked about a little <laughs> strip of paper. and uh, There was no internet. So, no internet any, then. <laughs> no. Oh, gosh, no. So, so he sent me the uh, 
the first group of samples, I remember them because they arrived on the day that John F. Kennedy was shot in November of uh, 1963. So um, I went through them all, and then I placed an order for 500 guitars. I'd earned a bunch of money doing paper routes and even water ski lessons and guitar lessons and mowing lawns and all that stuff. And so I ordered 500 guitars, and they came in. And I hired a friend because I was only uh, 14 then to drive me around to some music stores to see what they thought of the guitars. Uh, my sister had learned how to put decals on them, so I had the Bedell brand uh, on these guitars. Well, as it turns out, they were the same guitars, because I didn't design them, as um, other companies were selling in the U.S. with their name on them. All right. <laughs> but I had priced mine at 50% of the price. So um, I didn't have any overhead. I had my, my folks' garage and basement. I had my sister. I paid a little money, too. And I had a friend that uh, drove me. I was I was the rest of the whole company. So everywhere I went, people bought them. But by the way, so was, the, ordered, was there was there any uh, competition backlash at that time, or was was anybody uh, coming after you, or what? You know, I don't remember that, but it was you know I was just a little pipsqueak. I was fourteen <laughs> years old. That's amazing. Probably weighed one hundred ten pounds, and yeah. um, and I think people were kind of like, "Who is this kid? You know, is this for real?" That's awesome. Uh, but every store I went to, because you know, they said, "Shucks, if you can sell them to me at that price, you know, I'll take them." So then um, the Beatles showed up on Ed Sullivan in February of 64. And as you recall, Jeff, the whole music thing just exploded. <laughs> it did. It changed. There were grand fans changed. at every corner. Yeah, I right? was doing that. You yeah, that's what I, I did. <laughs> that's right. <Yeah. laughs> so uh, I opened my first actual music store in 1966. So that year I opened the second one. So I went through high school in the music business, went to school in the mornings and worked in the afternoons and um Build up a really nice little business. Then in 1968, my parents convinced me that um, I had a long life in front of me and that I really should go to college. <laughs> so I sold the business, went to the University of Colorado, um, and then lived my life like you did in other industries. And when I retired in 2007, that didn't work. So we <laughs> bought the local music store in Aspen, Colorado, and then I flew off to China and um, found what we thought was the best factory. Uh, in China and started rebuilding my Bedell guitars. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. It's just great, uh, great to have you on. Yeah, it's good to be here. Awesome. Okay, well, listen, like uh, like everybody's kind of getting used to, we, uh, we always start off with some foundational information. And uh, I can tell you, uh, I've been watching Eastwood Guitars for many years, uh, but I think our listeners would enjoy knowing something about the history in terms of your own path up to starting the company and, uh, you know, the premises upon which the company was started. So what can you tell us? Sure. Well, um, to try to keep it relatively brief, but the business side of it fully intact, I think we have to go back to uh, 1997, which was a couple of years after eBay first started. At that time, I had, as a, as a hobby, I was collecting weird oddball guitars and I started up what is what you would call today a blog, but at the time it was just a website called My Rare Guitars. I remember that. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it was, the funny thing was it was only two years after eBay started and really the intention of that whole site was just to help me um, buy, sell and trade weird guitars because the, the more you get, the more you want. And that, but that was not at all my full time work. Um, you know, I, I had I had never been involved in the guitar business whatsoever. I came from the high tech background, and at the time I was living out in San Jose. And um, my rare guitars was just simply a way to document, write, uh, f photograph, and post all of my findings about these crazy guitars. So it was really just you know my passion was not the high tech industry. My passion was guitars. But it was a hobby. It didn't. It now, wasn't really an income. Let so, me just uh, quick ask you: um, Your passion was guitars. Did that start earlier on with you? I mean, when you were oh, yeah. younger. Uh, oh when, yeah. When did when that I, start? It, it came out of just a, a passion for rock and roll. I was I was one of those kids since I was ten or eleven years old that bought, spent every penny I had on buying records at the record store. Okay. And so I, I built up a large uh, record collection and. You know, most of it was guitar-based music from mostly from England at the time. Because originally I was growing up, I grew up in Canada, but we didn't get out to California until the early '90s because the high-tech industry led me there. But yeah, it was rock and roll, 
And I started, uh, I just always had this obsession with crazy, weird guitar. And we're talking not Fender, not Gibson, but the crazy, weird things out of Japan that had way too many knobs and too many pickups and tremolos on everything and sparkle finishes. So that was, that was, that was my thing. And when, you know, basically eBay, the internet, the ability to build your own website all kind of came together in the mid nineties and allowed somebody like me to start documenting what I was excited about. Really that, that was, that's where it started. How that evolved into, into Eastwood was quite simply the natural progression of it. Over time, you, when, when you, when you have something you're passionate about on the internet, people, people find you and Mm -hmm. track down what you're interested in because they have like-minded interested and interests and they, they want, uh, they want the same guitars you have. And over time, there's just not enough of them, not enough of them to go around. So I just started thinking, well, why not make some replicas of them? And that's what was what led to starting Eastwood Guitars. So, Patricia, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's great to have you here on GBR. Well, I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. Great. Well, let's get started. You know, we always start off with some foundational stuff about the building blocks that ultimately formed the foundation for your business and career over the years. So I'm wondering if you could tell us some of the things that represent your building blocks and which you think have had the most impact. Well, your question is about building blocks, and I'll, I'll tell you, my stumbling blocks became my <laughs> building a, blocks. That's okay. You know, we love stumbling <laughs> blocks, too, because that's all, well, as we say, R&D. Yeah, well, indeed. So um, I was very young to begin playing a musical instrument simply because my father was a musician and we had a family tradition of, of playing music. And so I got started very early and he was a clarinet player okay. who taught me first. And then my next real serious teacher was a trumpet player. So mm-hmm. I had this lack of local expertise that really could have helped me at, as a pretty you know, advanced player at a young age. So I took the path that's not surprising, and that was to go to college. Right. And you know, I got accepted into Penn State on an audition because my flute teacher pushed me through the door <laughs> to go do it. Well, how did that trumpet teacher work out with teaching flute? <laughs> Well, he was incredible, honestly. Yeah. He, he, and so he taught me the very basic structure of music, and mm-hmm. he was a talented musician himself. And so in that regard, he, my, my flute teacher, who was a trumpet player, was a true inspiration to me. And it was his tenacity to teach me flute as a trumpet player that kept me going forward. But the, the next stumbling block was was really pivotal and, and has helped inform what's at place at Artist Works. And that is, I got into Penn State and I was there for six months. And all of a sudden, my flute teacher didn't get tenure and she moved on. Oh, boy. <laughs> so there's, and this is not uncommon to have a lack of consistency of instruction, especially in the high schools and in, and sometimes in the colleges as well. Um, it's different for Juilliard. It's different for, you know, Curtis Institute, but at Penn State, when music is not the function, the main core competency, let's say, of, of what that university is known for, people go where the opportunities are. And so I, you know, I twice had these stumbling blocks that really made me later in life have kind of that epiphany, wow, there's major inconsistency out there. And I was sort of hopping around with uh, flute teachers trying to get what I desperately needed, which was help, you know, in, in moving forward. So those were my two stumbling blocks that really became the building blocks of the model that we have in place at Artist Works. Well, David, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule and coming on GBR with us. Excited to be here, Jeff. I really um, I love your program and I'm excited to share some of the reverb story with you. Awesome. Well, as my listeners know, I, I almost well, I always start off with something uh, about these uh, foundational components. We like to talk about building blocks that um, form the foundation upon which careers and businesses sit on top of. And, you know, I'd like to know what kinds of things in your history represent building blocks for you, which have had the most impact. You know, um, well, I mean, I, you know, I grew up in the seventies and, and definitely, you know, music has had a huge impact on me. You know, the kind of music I grew up with from, you know, 
breaking those Led Zeppelin al- al- albums to those early police albums and, and Bob Marley and Bob Dylan and the influence of the 60s and 70s and, and early 80s uh, music had such impact on on who I am as a as a business person, as a as an individual, as someone who really wants to um, create, you know, great music or great businesses. It's all the same. It's just this desire for creating and building things. Um, but definitely started off with a love for music. When I was 18, I uh, bought my first guitar, saved up a bunch of money for my first guitar, and I didn't have any formal music education. I was more self-taught and wanted to uh, wanted to get at, get at it. I didn't, uh, I wasn't really as focused on joining bands and playing in that way as much as I was in the studio. I loved the, the, the studio sound and I, I pursued um, as a hobby recording engineering in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, I, um, I did that post-college as a recording engineer let me ask for a you, couple let, of years. Let me interject one thing. I, I don't like to do that, but, but do you remember, or can you tell me what that first guitar was? Do you remember what kind it was? Or Yeah, it was a, a Japanese import of, uh, it wasn't an Ibanez, but it was, I don't even recall, oh, Greco. It was a Greco uh, 335 style uh, Japanese import, mm-hmm. and uh, I recently sold it actually. Um, but it was uh, it was given to me by my cousin, the first one. But I always wanted a Stratocaster, so when I saved up enough money, I bought my first Stratocaster at 18 or 19. That was when I considered it was my first guitar that I actually went out and bought, and it was uh, a 70s Stratocaster at the time, which wouldn't have been considered vintage in I, the 80s. Yeah, I had but, one of um, It was too. a big. <laughs> it, yeah. was, it was a black strat, uh, you know, Eric Clapton inspired. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Okay, so you, uh, I interrupted you, but but I'll let you go ahead and continue as you uh, went into the recording part of it, and that was. Part yeah. Of so it. my my passion to to be in the business and and be involved in the creation of music was geared around uh, focused on uh, engineering, uh, music production, studio work. But I realized pretty quickly after a year or two of it, I wasn't going to be great at it. And to make a living as an engineer, you have to really be great and you really have to um, um, put in the hours and and pursue. So I gracefully said, um, I'm not going to this isn't this isn't going to turn out well if I if I commit my entire life to um, a a life of production and engineering. And I pivoted to software. Um, Mm -hmm. So I started my first software business in uh in the early 90s after leaving the studio business i was really inspired by actually all the digital movement that was happening in the studio business going from tape to um digital devices like the Sinclair, or Mm -hmm. we had an ssl board at the Mm -hmm. time that we that was all automated so um that really inspired me and then i i taught myself um, to code and eventually started my first software company in the travel industry i had a background my family was in the travel industry back in Michigan. And I built a database system, a CRM called client base that was okay. geared towards um, helping the travel uh, travelers do do more travel marketing. Was that fairly w- well received? It was, it was my, uh, we launched it in, uh, I launched it in 93, 94. And uh, I ended up selling it to uh, ultimately American airlines or oh. the, part of Sabre right. in 98, 99. And, um, so here I was almost 30 and I had sold my first company and I was uh, pretty much on top of the world um, feeling feeling pretty good about it. I had a non-compete in that industry. So the good thing about a non-compete is it says, well, what else can I do? Um, For, how can I reinvent you. myself? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, it forces you. So that was your first big payday? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I uh, I think I had a st- I started buying. That's when actually I started getting a little bit more acquired taste for guitars. I didn't buy like real heavy vintage, which I should have, this is the late nineties. I should have of really loaded up on some vintage, but I, I remember I bought an ES-125. I bought a, like a 52 tally reissue. Oh. So I started to sort of get a taste for uh, having some guitars around, around the house and some recording equipment as well. Hey, Crystal, welcome to GBR, and, and thanks for taking the time, frankly, on a Saturday morning to, uh, to come on the show and be with us today. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Great. That's always a good start. Um, and speaking of starting, let's, uh, let's keep with tradition here and, and get right into some uh, foundational stuff and find out some of the things in your earlier years, you know, as you would define them, 
that uh, might have had a significant and, and lasting effect or impact on your career and your business later in life? Most of us have one or two of those. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I would say kind of twofold, but first of all, I played competitive uh, tennis growing up. And I think playing a, a sport competitively is just such a great place to learn a lot of lessons that carry over into business. Um, first sure. of all, it takes a lot of hard work. You know, you have to practice, you have to work hard. And I think you also have, you learn a little bit about failure and accepting failure, but that that just means you get out there and practice harder and work harder. And then you get to experience those wonderful times of, of winning and success. Um, and then, you know, depending on what sport, I guess, you know, there's just a whole element of teamwork too that, that um, really, I think, carries over into, into your work life later. So I, I really credit that with um, kind of teaching me to be able to, to take some licks occasionally and, and, you know, and get back out there and try again and try harder. And uh, so I think that that would probably be the first thing. Yeah, that's, uh, then, that's very logical. And, and we see that all the time in business, lots of uh, sort of sports connections and team building things and stuff like that. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then the second thing is I just had a, a group. My father was just such a great entrepreneur um, and kind of just always seeking adventure too. And so I just lived a, a really, um, or, you know, as a role model, he was, he just taught me so many great things, um, about taking risk, about getting out there, building relationships. Um, and you know, he was in the music industry, so got early exposure to things like going to the NAMM show and, and you know, what, what the music industry is all about. And then just on this other side of kind of seizing life and, and having adventures and, and, kind of putting yourself out there. And I could just think of all these wonderful things we did. Um, I have this funny story that I always tell people that they laugh of my dad teaching me to water ski. And he was convinced that I should be able to slalom when I was six. Oh. And so I was, I mean, I don't know how many times I face planted. It might've been a hundred, oh, but, um, <laughs> but eventually I got up and, um, but those things are things that kind of make you stronger and, and make you believe in yourself. And, and then, um, and I guess just, you know, always just, seizing the day and, and seizing what's out there. Um, you mentioned your dad was in the music uh, side of things. What what kind of uh, activity was he involved in? Yeah, so I guess um, in the 60s, he started in kind of the recording side, selling recording equipment. And then uh, 70s and 80s had a company that um, sold all sorts of musical instrument equipment, um, everything from Akai to um, Jackson guitars, Charvel guitars. Um, so it was a, it was a fun time, I guess, in the early eighties being involved with the Kai and kind of the sampling time. So we had all sorts of, uh, interesting people in our home and, uh, and at the office. So that was fun to be a part of. Well, what did you think? Did that little sampler inspire you to go back and listen to the long form interview? Let me know your thoughts if you're so inclined or sitting, standing hanging upside down if that's your thing. But we always love to hear from you. And you can, as always, reach out to us through the contact page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Guitar Business. You can email us directly at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com or if all else fails, just call us. Call us on our GBR hotline at 888 888- 777-2404. It's easy. So next week, we're going to resume our regular interview format. And we have some terrific guests already lined up uh, that I think you're really going to enjoy. However, my policy has always been not to announce the upcoming interview guest until it's been recorded. I mean, I'm not superstitious to any degree, but I'd rather not commit and have to walk it back if something comes up and we can't do it. But that being said, you know, like so many other things, that could change in the future. So we'll see. I guess it's possible that I could hire a producer that would uh, make all those arrangements. and Maybe an agent or a publicist or who knows what. But at the moment, I have all of those jobs. I don't mind doing it. I know how to do all those things and a lot more. I mean, I've been doing all this stuff for a long time, so I'm reasonably good at it. But I think a lot of you will understand this. There's a certain amount of comfort in knowing that you can handle it all. 
I know many guitar builders who operate that way and many of them with incredible work to show for it. But just because you can do it all does not always mean that you should do it all. And I confess, I run GBR myself as producer, host, editor, and marketer. I built the studio, built all the websites for the company, and much more. But there's always a lot more to do. I mean, we have an ongoing business to run. I guess you could call it the day job of sorts. But GBR is definitely part of that and an important strategic piece of the puzzle known as Guitar Business Media, which includes Guitar PR and other ongoing projects that we're involved in. So I understand that there's kind of a comfort zone in running things yourself, but let's face it, depending on your destination or destinations, because there can be more than one and they can change from time to time, but there are limitations on what one person can do. It's possible to have a, a good sense and clear vision of where you're going, only to discover at some point that you've hit a wall, you're maxed out. And at that point, you usually find yourself having to make some rather definitive choices. So, if that sounds like you, I'll just give you the same advice I end the show with every week. Stay positive, stay focused on your destination, but keep all the options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you again on episode 38. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.